Hello and welcome to the Bossit Podcast with Mark Edwards and Michael Humblet. This podcast is released every week and is an over-the-shoulder look of a frank and candid discussion between two experienced software executives, providing you with useful tips, techniques and the latest concepts to help you grow your software business in the fast-paced digital age. So let's get into it. Here is Mark Edwards and Michael Humblet. Good afternoon, Michael. How are you? Good afternoon, Mark. I'm fine. How are you? Yeah, busy. It's um, it's a busy week. We've got the bad weather here. Yeah, yeah, I've seen. I was there. I was in London, and it was actually snowing when I was there. So yeah, we've still got the snow. And, yeah. uh, there's more snow expected any minute, actually, where I am. So we're expecting snow here right the way through the night. So it'll be interesting to see what it's like in the morning. Yeah. Plans for yeah. meetings tomorrow may be abandoned, but we'll see. Anyway, um, I wanted to have a quick chat, first of all, about the seminar that we were both involved with on Tuesday, because that's always quite uh, quite fun. Absolutely. For entrepreneurs, getting face-to-face, covering some of the points uh, that we were covering. I mean, the seminar focus, as you know, was, winning, was called Winning the Software Tech Game, and talking about what's changed for the software industry, fast pace of change and what we're seeing in some of the newer businesses and how they're progressing very, very quickly because they've adopted those changes more effectively. Mm -hmm. Some of the younger entrepreneurs that we're seeing, you know, some that we both know that uh, are leveraging those newer techniques very effectively. Uh, Absolutely. But we met a nice range of people, some very interesting people we were talking to. What, what, were, what were your thoughts? Well, it's very similar. I thought there was a lot of energy. I, I feel they want to change. They want to want to learn. They want to implement. Because I, I got after it lots of very pragmatic questions. And I thought it would be more strategic type of questions. So uh, I like that. I like that it's hands-on because it means they're ready to move for me. Yes. They're ready to change. I, I like it because you get that immediate feedback as well. True. The seminar itself, I think, lasted just over three hours, but we had opportunities in the break and afterwards to speak to people on a one-to-one -one basis, and I think that's where you really start to get a feel for their thinking, and also get some feedback on the points that, that you know, the main points that we were making, what was a, what was really resonating with them and making sense, and where it needed further explanation because it's a big subject, you know well, many subjects that we were covering when you're talking about the success of a software company. Uh, for me, I, I, I think the main point that I was hoping would really stick was about just the attitude of looking at the value of your own business and how you can build that. And that, obviously, the one that I'm always saying is you should always be building towards an exit, not leave it 12 months beforehand. You need to have a business that's prepared. You need to have a business that is has a proper exit strategy. And also, what a proper exit strategy is. It's something that's spoken about a lot. I find that, that very rarely does somebody really have a solid exit strategy. And how that can adversely affect the business, not just at the final point of sale, but throughout its life. So they're the things that I was, I was looking for to get feedback on really to see if it was resonating and it seemed to be you know that seemed to be you know getting some good feedback and getting some good questions as well i know that you were having some very specific questions and it looked like you were getting some good engagement as well yeah yeah i i always put in some little parts in my presentation that are little how do you say little diamonds uh, with some advice, we say, look, this company has been doing this very successfully, and and I know a lot of companies are not doing it just to trigger their minds, and it also makes conversation easier because you, when you go to these events, you see this guy on stage, and it's kind of there is a big distance between you and the person. Then classically, they come to you and say, oh, that was a great presentation, blah, blah, blah. and it's better if you say something that you know people will be triggered and come and say, what what was that exactly? Can you explain that a bit more? And then you really know that there is interest. And it's a much nicer, better conversation because you can give something back. You can give value. It's not about, you know, really getting deep, deeply more engaged, but really giving something. I like that. 
Yes. I the do. better base. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. You, we can deliver some value. And I think at the same time, we can get to know those founders and entrepreneurs. And I think when you do that, you also start to get a feel for their business. Because, you know, we're a great believer that, that businesses do tend to be created in the profile of their founders and of the CEOs. And I think um, it was actually very encouraging. I mean, we had some people that had travelled from quite far and wide to London to attend the seminar, which, which is always encouraging. Somebody had come from Serbia the night before. We had a few others travel from outside the UK. Whereas when we first started doing this, we thought that it would be just people from the London area, but people are definitely worth, you know, they're definitely finding the time to travel to it, so they, they must be seeing that value in it. Um, but it's, um, yeah, it's, it's also useful because you start to see where their priorities lie and also get to better understand their problems. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. I think that's really important. That's one of the things that I'm always saying to our clients is you know, stop focusing so much on your solution, get to understand the problem. So applying that to us is it's understanding to a deeper level what are the issues that these business leaders and owners are facing. And there's a lot of common, common uh, denominations, common denominators, regardless of the size of the business. I think um, prioritizing and knowing where to focus your time, because there's always a thousand things that you can do when you're running a business, and there are always, you know, fires that you have to put out. And coming back and really focusing on those areas that make a significant change to your business for the good, it can be difficult to do that because I suppose with a lot of those things, they're not urgent. Putting out no. The fire is. Yeah, and there is always a, a bigger fire somewhere close yes. by. So yeah. talking, talking about fires, if you allow me to jump, dive in, Go for it. one of the big fires I, I always see popping up and I actually had one uh, last week is the famous tie-in between sales and product, product development, the endless battle. And I'll, I'll give a good example. It's a classic one. So sales guy comes in and says to the execs, listen, I can close this big deal, but in order to close that big deal, I need a certain feature that we don't have. In the same time, an existing, large existing customer says, guys, I want to do more with you. Uh, or I'm going to leave, I'm going to leave. Basically, they put pressure and say, but I need feature Y. Now, product development looks at this and they can only do one thing. And then the big question comes, what do you choose? How do you make that choice? And I think it's a topic that I see coming back all the time, especially when you're small. It's, it's, it's just a matter of resources. But when you get bigger and larger, more established business, it's much more how do you say, much more critical actually because that process needs to be properly done and properly aligned because otherwise you get really discrepancies within teams and they start fighting and you don't want that. Yes, yes. So That's a difficult one. Yeah, so, so what I do is I introduce something called product boards where actually there is somebody from sales, there is somebody from product, there is an executive, a sponsor, and then there is, there is some more people depending on, on what you need, not too many, four or five, maybe six, they all have to prepare a slide and then you actually make those choices because first thing is going to be about sales is what's the pipeline, what's the forecast, why do you need certain features, what has your highest priority if you had to choose. Engineering says this is my backlog, this is the problem. Then you have probably customer success slash support saying, look, these guys, they want that feature or they're off. And then at the end, you discuss and you debate. And when you walk out that room, you have you've all made a choice and there is only one veto and the veto is the exec of course that that is is basically has the money or the resource in essence which is the same thing in this case that's an interesting one um, that actually is something something related to that uh, is a client that i've got currently at the moment and it's around their the service that they provide, which does does relate to the, to the software that they've developed. But one of the things that they said to go and worked with them on 
was in standardizing their service because previously what they had had was that their direction regarding the service that they were providing was being dictated by the requests from customers so that they would have um, a particular way of going about it was in the area of data capture and it was about cleaning data and making sure that the right data was available to flow into back office system and they made a significant step forward when they started saying no to the customer but in a in a more subtle way by saying okay but why do you want it that way and by digging down deeper they actually realized that a lot of the requests that they were getting especially from new clients was just purely based upon this is the way we've always done it this is yeah always worked with a service provider in this way but it wasn't necessarily the best way and I, yeah, I, 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 I can liken that you know if you yeah. imagine going to a doctor and you telling the doctor well I want you to prescribe me with these antibiotics because I've just read on the internet I think it's the right way to do it or that's what I've always had in the past when I've had this pain and he agreed with you where would you put him on your scale of confidence <laughs> yeah well it, it's it's a bit like the story i told uh, a few uh, podcasts ago of sweet bright so they, they make an application for the brokers how do you call it again the real estate real estate agents yes and typical real estate agents has this uh, they have a window and they put all the all the you know the papers of the houses with the price and then and then these guys say with our software you don't need it nobody nobody needs it you have that online i mean the millennials who are buying houses they never go to the shopping window so when you when you drive by you see the old people watching them and then and he says the most asked feature in his software is everybody saying i need to have the shopping window online and he's saying you don't need that that's so old school to put a sticker sticker on it sold because it just doesn't work it, it it's polluting your feet technically speaking so it's the same story you just did. It's just they move whatever they have and they don't leverage the digital options. They just want the same thing. It's yes. like, you you know I'm a big advocate on this LinkedIn, right? So it's like yes. I only add people I have met in real life on LinkedIn. And I'm like, you're copying a business card. That's That's not how you can leverage a platform like that. You need to do it really differently. You need to start reaching out to people you find interesting and you want to talk to and start online. Yeah, that's restricting yourself by, by old style thinking, isn't it? Absolutely. It, it's just a different way of increasing your network. And I, I, I see that a lot. You're right. It's, it's people applying you know, traditional old style thinking to, to a new way of working. And it's yeah. not always the right way to go. No, I agree. I agree. Fully agree. But it's, I mean, I feel it at myself. I mean, for instance, one of the things that, and I'm still amazed with this, I come from the generation where I would send text messages to people. And I like to work with text messages. And I used to have a boss that would phone me every, all the time and say, no, phone me, it's harder. And I would complain and say, dude, send me text messages. It's more efficient. Funnily enough, now I'm running my own team. I call these people... <laughs> I'm doing I'm doing what I hated that my boss was doing because I said I need to give you the context properly. So it, it's 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 a classic one. And where I want to get to is if I look at at some of my team members, what they're doing is they speak in pictures. They send little snippets of video and pictures, and that goes really fast. And and I'm like looking at it, and I'm and I'm still thinking, but. If I send it to you, it will like look to Instagram. It disappears and I, I want to keep it. So, I, I mean, I really feel old school when I see these guys moving and I'm thinking, and I'm in the middle of this digital evolution world. And I, if, if I already have it, I can imagine somebody in the transportation sector because I was today in the transportation sector, really old school systems looking at all of this and thinking, you guys are all nuts. I mean, I'm just going to fill in my paper and, and I'm done. Right. <laughs> So you're saying you're out of date then in your thoughts? Yeah, it's 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 scary. Yeah, I, I am. I am. Let, let me tell you a really, really, really funny story, Mark. This is a bit a bit embarrassing, but this really happens. About, I love about, funny stories, especially if they're embarrassing. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah well, exactly. <laughs> so about two months ago, I'm in, a, I'm, in a, I'm in a meeting with four or five, let's say, executives. Really difficult discussion because we had to carve the company in a few parts and what we, we do with the people. I mean, really difficult discussion. And my screen of my laptop is projected to the um, on this very large Samsung thing and there is a webcam in it and we're phoning people through the webcam and suddenly my Skype starts ringing. And I have a deal with the family. If it rings twice... You make sure you pick up. If it rings three times, somebody's dying. Walk out the room. You have to yes. get home, you know? Yeah. So, pick it up. Pick it up. So, suddenly this thing starts ringing. They all look at me and I'm like, guys, it's the only ones. Don't worry. I put it down. It starts ringing again. And and I tell them, so look, if it rings twice, I kind of need to pick up. If it, and I, I kill it. So, if it rings three, three times, then somebody's dying. So, they say, no, no, don't worry. Pick it up. So, rings three times. I pick it up and then I see Skype, it opens up, so in full front of all these people, and it's one of my sons at home with his best buddy, both of them smiling at Skype and saying, hey, Michael, we're playing Minecraft and we were wondering if you want to join the game. <laughs> <laughs> so these guys, they laughed. It was funny because they laughed. I said, guys, you have to leave me alone. So they really laughed. And still up to date, they sometimes still send me mails about Minecraft and uh, decisions. <laughs> <laughs> I, many years ago, when I first started this business, I was, um, I was working from home one day. And uh, I've got three children. And my youngest, he must have been uh, very, he was very, very young. He was just at the age where he could, where he could talk. And I, at the time, I was having a conversation with a, a senior exec from a very big American organization that we've been working with for some time. We had a big ongoing project. And my son was wanting to come in to see me. And he was knocking on the door and I was trying to hold him from coming in. I was holding the door closed. And I could hear him banging on the outside saying, Daddy, Daddy, wee, wee, Daddy, Daddy, wee, wee. <laughs> yeah, yeah, classic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The things, the things I'm on the toilet. The there is no paper. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so we've both we've both been there. And I, one of the things that I've got jotted down here, and I, and I'm thinking, this is something that that occurred from a conversation I had earlier this week about an organisation that I know very well. But it's a, it's a common thing comes up many many times. You know, I'm a great advocate in in you know keep it simple, get it done. And ego, this is something I talk about a lot, is when you get a number of senior executives together, the problem that you have with ego, where, and maybe it's a male thing, it's, it's sort of a, not so, no. much, not so much bragging rights, but no, we're it's... discussing a topic, so there's a business that I know, thinking of this example, they're, they're, they're quite old school. They've got a very complex business now. It's become overly complex. complex. They've, grown, um, they've grown quite well, but they've grown by making acquisitions and they've added on technologies and solutions that they've sold. And the business is starting to look a real mess. You know, it's very difficult to understand exactly what they do, apart from you know, we sell a lot of technical stuff to help you make your business more efficient, you know. How many times have we heard that? Yeah. And I think of some of the management there, and the problem is that in bringing those people together, a lot of time and effort can be wasted on them showing each other how clever they are rather than yeah. actually getting the solution agreed and just get it done. And I do see this a lot. And, I, you know, it's a plea to people in the software industry you know, when you come together with your colleagues and with your peers and where you perhaps you're using the outside people is leave your ego at home, guys, please. It, you know, I, I have seen it so often where you agree the methodology and somebody wants to show off the fact that they know four other methodologies for doing the same thing. And you think, OK, great, but let's just pick one and get it done. You know, and the yeah. focus, you know, the focus on the tool and not actually getting the job done. Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I would add, I, I'm, I'm also a big advocate of 
that and I, I, I call it production. I want them to start doing it, but smaller and faster. And I keep pressing a lot of it. But but I yes. see it also, by the way, it's not only men. I've seen women do it too. Yeah. It's it's for me, um, it's 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 about power. It's about power play and, and feeling, making sure you, you are regarded as important. And some people have it a lot more than others, of course, male and alpha behavior. But I, I just call it an alpha behavior. So female, I mean, women can have that too, but, but I see that a lot actually. And, and you have to get through that. You have to breach that. It's, yeah. it's so important and nothing gets done. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I think that if there is that ego massaging that needs to be done, well, then you just get out. Get the business running successfully, sell the business, and, and you can hire people to carry you to work and on a little throne if you want, you know, and you could wear a little <laughs> we, crown. We should start <laughs> with a sales afford, slide, like the it. second slide. should be a guy on a throne with a lot of people below it and said, this is what you want to solve. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a, that's a good one. I, I should think you probably have the same when you're talking to sales teams, because I can oh, be, yeah, yeah. be involved with sales training. You'd get the yeah. salespeople together and yeah. you'd get the one guy that he actually doesn't want to learn. He just wants to try and show everyone how much he knows about selling. Yeah. And the funny thing is he's often not the guy who's sitting top of the sales figures. Yeah. He's just the guy I, that talks the most. Yeah, I I I agree. And and although I have to say I do like it when in a training there is one of these guys because that's a lot of fun because I use that in the training because at the end, a bunch of sales guys and you have a trainer, you have to also show that you can handle these type of people. But um, it's tough. Actually, I was on a call. This happened uh, last Friday. I was on a call and I'm explaining what I do to this company. And it's very weird because on the other side of the call, there is no image, but I, I there are six people. And then out of nowhere, this guy jumps in on the phone, interrupts the the. Um, the conference call and he starts saying hey i'm this guy da, 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 da. and i say okay thanks for interrupting <laughs> um would you mind if i just continue and then come back to you and he's like no no you should ask me what i do and and i really thought this is really weird and then i while i said okay here's the platform then he of course didn't know what to say classic yeah? yes. and then and then I, I took over and then i googled him and then i realized he's a sales guy but he actually owns 30 percent of the shares so, of course, he needed to say he's the most important guy in the room. It's <laughs> always the same. <laughs> yeah. but, but Mark, sometimes, and I see that with a lot of people, sometimes we all, because we all deal with these people every day, yes. we all get frustrated. And, 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 and I, one day I, I, I had a big fight. Sometimes you're just like, you're so tired of this behavior, you put a stick in the ground and you start fighting like crazy yes. and i i have this once or twice a year then i just like my my bucket is spilling over and i'm start to fight and i know it's not going to work and the last time i had this i was really sitting in my office and thinking damn how i'm gonna how am i gonna handle this and there is a, a, a ceo of a neighboring company that walks by he sees me he walks in he says you me now out and i just follow him and he takes me to the the coffee place he puts a coffee in front of me and he said, listen, Michael, I'm going to give you the best advice in your life. There are no shortcuts. There is no way of doing this faster. You need to listen to the guy. You need to nod yes. You will be 10 times more efficient than trying to, to shortcut this process. And I think every time now when I get into that situation, I think of that and I kind of nod and I think, you know what, I'm just going to leave my ego at the door, say he's the most important guy in the world and suddenly after a week, everything is solved. Yes. Yeah, that's probably good advice. So there probably is you need to give that person some space to yeah. uh, say what they feel they've got to say. We can call this podcast. There are no shortcuts. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's true. That, 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 yeah, and, and, and giving them space and time, which actually is one of the other topics that I wanted to cover today and I think is really important and, and is about taking space and time. And that space and time for yourself and getting the work-life balance. Because I think without it, you end up seeing a lot of very stressed entrepreneurs. And, and that's, I was reading a book just uh, the other week, and it was saying that 49% of business owners have at some stage suffered from mental stress, mental health problems. 
that was quite alarming. I mean, I don't know where they got that from. It did seem very high, but I would believe that it, that, that, you know, there's a lot of people out there that um, have suffered from mental health problems. And I think that what it does is it, is it puts you in a less receptive state. You're no longer in the best state to deal with the problem. I think that's something worth bearing in mind when you think about, you know, do I need to pursue my hobby? Do I need to take time off? And when you take time off, can I turn my email off? Can I turn my mobile off? At the moment, I've got my mobile turned off for a few days because I left it in London when we did our seminar. (laughs) (laughs) In a way, there is a bit of stress relief there. I mean, I I know it's safe and the people have got it, but I can't pick it up. And uh, I don't get it until tomorrow. So there's, it's given me a bit of distance and it's given me a bit of time. But I think it's really important also that you get a work-life balance correct. I, I, you know, I've got, I've got a number of different interests at the moment. Photography is a constant one for me. Um, fitness is one that I pursue and I'm doing boxing training just to vary it because it's a good form of fitness. And recently I started acting. I've, I've got a part in a local amateur dramatics play. Is that why you're wearing your unshaved um, style? Uh... Yes. Ah, yes. <laughs> okay. Then it makes sense. I was really worrying about your mental health, actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. No, it's because I'm playing the part of an art professor from the 1930s. And I thought, what is he going to look like? He's probably going to have a moustache or a beard. Uh, so I thought I would, I would grow a beard. That's, that's the idea behind it, yeah. But those things mean that when I go to, for instance, go to uh, rehearsals, mm-hmm. the the problems, thinking about about work, business, my clients' problems, you can't be doing that because it, it requires rehearsal, it re- requires focus and concentration. Because if I'm not focused, then I'm going to look foolish. And true, true. It really does. True. It, makes, it makes a big difference. Same with photography. You know, I went... I was uh, in Germany with some clients, and fortunately, they were very keen photographers. Mm-hmm. So we booked two days, and we were wandering around the city taking photographs. It was actually, they, they insisted, but they were right to do it. And it was very relaxing. Just I, yeah, I, yeah, I, I think walking, I mean, you know, Steve Jobs was one of the big famous guys who would walk. I, I, yep. I also think, I think also the brain, actually, there was a lot of studies that, when you learn something new or you need to you need to process something you you need to be you need to put your brain in like in standby mode idle mode because it works well um i've learned that with my boot camps i i in the beginning i overloaded them with information and it was i just wanted to show them all and <laughs> people would basically almost their brain would be fried and that's also not good so you have to balance that i'm still fi- f- trying to find a way to get them to move a bit more in the in the session so that's that's yes. a job on me but 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 i agree i mean uh what i like to do is i like to invite uh, other uh, ceos or whatever when they are stuck outside of their environment i ask them to my place i have uh, this room with one big wall where you can draw and i we just start drawing and that process, the physical things to do that makes their mind tick differently because you have a visual, visual, 80% of the people are visual and they draw, so they move. And actually, I used to take it even a, a level further. I would sometimes, when I know when people get stuck, I, I try to do something that they had to learn something new physically. For instance, for the first time, I would go to golf or whatever, just really physically that, yes. that the brain cannot think about the problems and that yes. really works i've heard of that before on executive training courses where yeah. they would teach all the executives to juggle for instance using yeah a classic one brain. yeah something that yeah. requires a focus yeah um, actually yeah. this is not something that we've discussed so i think we sort of touched upon it but at some stage in our podcast we might want to bring somebody in that we could talk to about some of the aspects that we've covered yeah. And one of the guys that I'd really like to bring in is a friend of mine who I've known for many, many years. Again, comes from the software sector, was a software salesman, had a software business himself, but then completely went in a different direction, found it was very, very stressful. And he started, started a coaching uh, company and he, was, he became a master practitioner for neuro-linguistic programming. Yeah. Yes. And then a few years ago came to me and he said, I'm stopping all of that. 
and he had built up a really big following. Uh, I think he had a database of like 30,000 uh, students, and that really surprised me. And, he said, and I said to him, That's Why? A you know, because you build up a lot of momentum, you build up a lot of value when you get to that stage. And he said, I found a better way. I found something that I believe in more than I do NLP. And it's called the principles. And uh, he sat down with me and over half an hour explained it to me. And I sort of, I instinctively got what he was talking about and the power to reduce stress with the principles. And I won't cover it today because it's, you know, it's a fairly big subject, but maybe sometime in the future. I'll, uh, I'll invite him on this podcast because I think it's something that a lot of people would find very, very valuable. Yeah, I, I fully agree. Yes. Yeah, we should invite sometimes guests to dig into yeah. one yes. one specific topic. Especially if the, you know, they're with, from within the software sector and they've got something to offer like that. I think it would make a lot of sense. Yeah. Well, we have been talking for 30 minutes and 30 seconds, so <laughs> it may be a good time to sort of start to wrap things up a little bit. Um, Absolutely. It's been good talking to you as usual. Thank you, Mark. I'll be looking forward to speaking to you again next week. Um, I'm, I'm being told that our podcasts, of which this is number six, are going to, is going to be put onto iTunes, and we're going to start promoting the podcast. Perfect. The idea Perfect. was that we build up a bit of a backlog because people often like to listen to one or two, so they just do it from the first one. And um, we're hopefully these new microphones that we've now both got. What are they called? Blue Blue Snowballs. Is that right? Is that what they're called? The Blue Snowball microphones. Yeah. Well, these have worked really well, and the sound quality will have improved. And, yeah. Um, and I think we should also share how we uh, one day we'll do a session on how do we do all of this so people can copy yes. and 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 see if it works for their business. Well, also, the other plan is that um, we're building a video set, and this will be a podcast, but it will also, on occasions, be something that people can watch on video as well. So it's developing from that one small idea. I think you said to me, let's try a podcast. <laughs> see where we end. <laughs> we'll see where we end. We can end with a full feature-length film with this, right? <laughs> yeah, I believe absolutely. Okay, Mark. All right, so this is Bossit, the Bossit podcast. The software entrepreneurs. Um, we hope you've enjoyed it, and uh, it's goodbye from me. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Michael. Cheers. Bye bye.